Uh, so I'd like to start just uh, by thanking the organisers, particularly Patrick and Vamsi, for the, <coughs> for the invitation uh, and the flattering introduction. Um, so uh, I won't say anything about politics, so I will go straight on to science. I guess there's lots of time to talk about that later. Although I did go to bed rather late. It was three, I think, when I finally went to bed. I had to watch the results coming in. Okay, so I'm based in a, in a place called the Gurdon Institute, which is a fundamental cell and molecular biology, developmental biology institute, um, funded primarily by Cancer Research UK and the Wellcome Trust. Um, and um, I've been there for 28 years, and we've been fundamentally focused on DNA repair mechanisms, um, but as Vamsi pointed out, we've translated some of this uh, into uh, arenas that have actually gone all the way into the clinic. Now, as a backdrop, I just want to highlight uh, a few key principles that are going to come up in my talk today. Um, one is that we're very used to thinking about genetics and thinking about the functions of individual genes, but of course genes encode gene products and gene products don't tend to work on their own. They tend to work together with other gene products in pathways or complexes or whatever. So when, when we're thinking about genes and the gene products and when we're thinking about the phenotypes that arise when you change or mutate or lose a gene function, we need to think about how that would, those phenotypes will also be influenced by the products of other genes and also by environmental factors. Okay. And in this regard, um, two key, key principles that are going to pop up a few times in my talk today are sort of shown here. And if we're thinking about interactions or, uh, between the products of genes, we can think about this in relation to two general uh, phenomena. One is genetic enhancement, and the other is genetic suppression. And the extreme example of genetic enhancers is something called synthetic lethality. We use the word synthetic because synthetic is when you put more than one thing together to generate something new. And what we're doing here is putting together a gene A defect together with a gene B defect to give rise to this extreme phenotype of death at the cellular or organism level, whereas Individual loss of gene A or gene B or changes in gene A or gene B don't give rise to death. At the other end of the extreme is synthetic viability, where a pathology or change, or even in this extreme example here, a death phenotype caused by a change in gene A can actually be, get rebalanced by a change in gene B. And anybody who's worked in model organisms over the years will know that if you carry out genetic screens, you can invariably identify genetic enhancers or suppressors of virtually every phenotype. Okay, so these principles are going to come up quite a few times in my talk, and hopefully I'll convince you that by understanding gene-gene interactions in these kinds of ways, it can lead us into insights into biology, but also provide opportunities for translating that uh, into medicines. Okay. Now, my work uh, in my lab largely focuses on DNA repair, uh, the amazing fact is that at rest, every cell in your body is sustaining somewhere in the region of 100,000 DNA lesions. And these, these are arising from endogenous processes that are going on in our cells. So the human body at rest um, is having to deal with huge numbers of DNA damage um, lesions um, every moment of the day. Uh, our cells are able to deal with this. Every life form is able to deal with these kind of lesions through the evolution of various DNA repair pathways that are dedicated to different forms of DNA damage that arise. Now, in principle, what we've learned over the last 20 or so years is that there are various systems in our cells to detect signal the presence of and repair DNA damage. And what I'm showing here is just a cartoon of the types of things that go uh, on in response to DNA double strand breaks, which are particularly toxic DNA lesions. So there are certain proteins including the protein Q, which uh, my lab stumbled across a number of years ago, are basically molecular policemen. These kind of proteins, including the Q protein, recognize DNA damage. And the Q protein, for example, we showed many years ago now, basically binds to DNA ends. So these protein complexes are often part of DNA repair mechanisms, but while repair is going on, particularly for very toxic and difficult to repair lesions such as double strand breaks, there are a whole range of other processes that are regulated and initiated in the cell, such as cell cycle uh, regulation, induction of certain DNA repair factors, cell cycle control, apoptosis, or senescence. We also need to think about DNA repair in other contexts, such as joint DNA replication, in the context of chromatin structure, nuclear architecture, and there are also interesting connections with other things, such as telomere maintenance. Now, my lab got into this arena through identifying a protein kinase, um, a protein kinase called DNAPK, um, that basically 
uh, work together with a protein called Q. So we know that certain protein kinases are recruited to and activated by DNA damage. And key examples of these are shown here. This protein ATM will pop up a little bit later on in my talk. We also know that other post-translational modifications play important roles uh, in the DNA damage response. So we're, they're affected by uh, methylations, for example, on histones and other proteins, protein acetylation, deacetylation, ubiquitylation, sumoylation, and other things such as poly-ADP ribosylation. So over the years, we've learned that the human DNA repair and DNA damage response network includes um, over 350 proteins. So these are quite complicated systems to understand. DNA double-strand breaks are particularly toxic DNA lesions, and they can be generated by physical rupture of DNA or by things such as ionizing radiations. But it's also worthwhile bearing in mind that DNA double-strand breaks can also arise by, through processing of other DNA lesions. So, for example, if you have a single-strand break in DNA, if the cell were to try and replicate this, um, this DNA molecule, this could give rise to double-strand breaks during DNA replication. Okay. Through work in, in many labs over many, many different... Uh, many, in many organisms in many, over many years, we've learned that there are two principal ways of repairing double-strand breaks. And these basically come in various forms, but they boil down to uh, two major mechanisms. One of these mechanisms is called non-homologous end joining. It involves a range of proteins, including QDNAPK. Um, and basically what non-homologous end joining does is if you've broken a DNA molecule, it brings the two DNA ends together, cleans them up, and pieces them together. Um, the other uh, DNA repair pathway, principal pathway, is called homologous recombination. This is a little bit more complicated. The double-strand break here has to get into synapsis with an un undamaged DNA molecule, and this is invariably the sister chromatid, um, which has an identical sequence. And in this pathway, um, it's able to rescue information that might have been lost around the double-strand break site. Now, it's... Very important that these pathways are done, used at the right time and the right place. Key factors in the homologous recombination pathway are proteins such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. I'll talk more about those in a few moments. Um, another protein that plays a role in helping homologous recombination is a protein called ATM, this kinase I talked about a few moments ago. And in regards to non-homologous end joining, the final step of non-homologous end joining is catalyzed by these factors here, DNA ligase 4 together with a range of other proteins, including XRCC4. They'll pop up a little bit later on. So what I'm hopefully going to convince you is that um, it's important these, our cells have multiple ways of repairing double-strand breaks, and it's also important that the cell uses these at the right time and at the right place. And if the cell does this wrong, and uses the wrong pathway, this can actually be toxic. So we've learned over the years that DNA damage response and DNA repair mechanisms are not only just fun and interesting to study, but they're also very important from the perspective of human biology and disease. So we know that inherited or acquired defects in these DNA damage response mechanisms can give rise to a whole range of pathologies in humans, and I guess most notably, uh, cancer. It's fairly obvious why cancer will arise through DNA repair defects. We all know that cancer is in large part um, uh, uh, catalyzed by the accumulation of mutations in certain cells which gives rise to their tumorigenic potential. And if you have defects in these pathways, you're more likely to sustain those mutations that fuel carcinogenesis. Okay. So DNA damage responses are of very high relevance to cancer. First, we know that inherited or acquired defects in DNA repair pathways can give rise to cancer. We also know to this day that um, uh, most cancer-causing agents work by generating DNA damage. And besides surgery, the most commonly used and still most effective treatments for cancer are actually through generating DNA damage, through standard chemotherapies or through radiotherapy. And it's important to understand how these therapies work at the cellular level, because success, of course, is based on cancer cell killing. Failure is based on the cancer cells repairing the damage and or, and or evolving resistance to these agents. We also know that side effects to these treatments uh, are caused by DNA damage uh, impinging on normal cells. We've also learned, particularly over the last 15 to 20 years, that the DNA damage response network provides opportunities for drug discovery. And it was basically with that idea in mind that um, I uh, decided to set up what came to be the world's first DNA repair company. Um, uh, well, the idea for this came up, the company was set up in 1997, it took me almost two years to get the company off the ground. And the bold concept behind QDOS was to develop small molecule inhibitors of DNA repair. Um, 
Proteus called, the, the, the company is called Kudos, um, was called Kudos because my whole career is based on what the protein Q does. That's how I got into this whole field. So anyway, my wife came up with that name and it stuck. Okay, so why would you want to inhibit DNA repair? That was the big issue. We now know that this has been a successful approach, but it... But the big issue of getting the company off the ground was it wasn't very intuitive. Why the heck would you want to come up with drugs to inhibit DNA repair when DNA repair is a good thing? So there was an important passage in the original business plan that, together with data supporting this general concept, um, got the investors over the line. Uh, and a simpler way of, predict, uh, of depicting um, what was in that uh, passage is really to show you, to take you through this slide here. We know that most, probably nearly all cancers, lose one or other DNA repair or DNA damage response mechanism. P53, for example, is part of the DNA damage response network. And of course, if you want to successfully treat cancer, you've really got to find something that's different between cancer cells and normal cells and exploit it. So if you buy the idea that defects or changes in the DNA repair network are a common feature of cancer, then this could be a key difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell. And so one of the concepts behind QDOS was to take this synthetic lethality genetic concept and translate it into a pharmacological application. So the idea here is if you have two DNA repair mechanisms, for example, or two other mechanisms, which are two different ways of fulfilling a, an essential process, if the cancer cell has lost one of those, that's a key difference to the normal cell, if you could come up with a pathway A inhibitor um, through targeting the product of gene A, you would have a selective effect on the cancer cell rather than the normal cell. Because if you inhibit pathway A in the normal cell, there's another way of doing this essential process. So that was one of the concepts. Um, the company uh, established itself based on my academic lab on a science park just near here. And over the years, we developed um, this compound together with several other compounds. This is a compound that we now know as Alaprib, um, or as it's now called, Limpasa. And what Alaprib does, um, it's a PARP inhibitor. What is PARP? PARP stands for poly-ADP ribose polymerase. And PARP enzymes, such as PARP 1 and 2, are basically associated with DNA repair. So what PARP does is bind to DNA breaks single strand breaks or double strand breaks and potentiate their repair through catalyzing a reaction where it basically generates uh, ADP ribose groups on itself and other proteins. And this helps to recruit the DNA repair pathways and change chromatin structure to potentiate single strand break repair uh, and base excision repair. Now what inhibitors of PARP uh, such as Alaprib do is basically prevent PARP carrying out this catalytic reaction so this slows down single-strand break repair, so these single-strand breaks persist. These compounds, such as Alaprib, also trap PARP on DNA. So it actually serves as a barrier to DNA repair and actually to DNA replication. Now, what we learned through using PARP inhibitors, such as Alaprib, is that they're not very toxic to normal cells. What happens um, to if you treat cells with PARP inhibitors, that these single-strand breaks persist but as the PARP inhibitor gets metabolized, then those single strand breaks can be repaired. But a much more um, difficult lesion that arises after you treat cells with PARP inhibitors is that if these cells are going through S phase, they'll generate DNA double strand breaks at the replication fork. Now that sounds really bad and it potentially is, but normal cells can deal with these double strand breaks arising in the presence of PARP inhibitors because they can carry out homologous recombination because that's the pathway you want to use when you've generated a break here. If the replication apparatus comes here, it will generate a double strand break, but at the same time, the replication apparatus would have, would have basically generated the sister chromatid, which is used by homologous recombination to mediate repair. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are associated with this mechanism. So it turns out that PARP inhibitors such as Laparib are not very toxic to normal cells, but they're very toxic to cells that lack BRCA1 or BRCA2 function through defects in homologous recombination. So these data came from a collaboration between Kudos, my lab, and Alan Ashworth's lab, uh, then at the Institute of Cancer Research. And what we basically found is that there's this striking difference in the toxicity of PARP inhibitors in the presence or absence of the BRCA1 and 2 proteins. So we've got three lines here. So this is a log surviving fraction of cells with a log increasing concentration of a PARP inhibitor here. 
and you can basically see there's a huge differential between these three lines. These three lines are generated by BRCA2++ cells here, BRCA2++ cells here, and BRCA2++ minus minus cells here. These are mouse ES cell studies, but you also see it in human cells. So these were very exciting results because they suggested that there might be an application for these kind of compound in the clinic, particularly with uh, women with inherited mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, it turns out that if, if you're a woman or a man with BRCA1 and BRCA2 inherited mutations, you've inherited just one bad copy. So these patients uh, have a wild-type copy, but they also have a bad copy of the gene in their normal somatic cells, in all their cells. And what happens during tumorigenesis is that the cell that eventually gives rise to cancers in these patients invariably loses the wild-type copy, so it becomes minus-minus. So the idea would be that exploiting this difference here between the plus-minus and minus-minus, this might be applicable in patients. Would this be a way, for example, of selectively killing the cancer cells in the patient, but not the normal cells, by synthetic lethality, if you like? Well, Kudos developed the compound from uh, biochemical assays it, it, uh, uh, that, that arose in my lab. We identified Alaparib, we formulated it, and took it into man. Uh, but in those days, the U UK biotech uh, arena wasn't quite as uh, well-resourced as, as it is now. And so basically, the company got to a stage where we didn't really have the resources to take this into the clinic, and we needed to partner with pharmaceutical companies. So we talked to various pharmaceutical companies, and in the end, one of those, AstraZeneca, decided it wanted to buy the whole company, and the company was sold to AstraZeneca. Uh, but uh, rather satisfyingly for everybody associated with it, they actually kept Kudos going in Cambridge for quite some years afterwards to take these programs further. They were then exported over to uh, Oldley Park, the other side of the UK, and more recently, <coughs> the whole lot has come back here again because AstraZeneca has relocated its global headquarters just up the road from us here. So many of my colleagues, or well, several of my colleagues who are in Kudos, moved to Manchester and are now back in Cambridge. Many of them wish that they'd kept their houses here because house prices have gone up quite a bit in the meantime. <coughs> anyway, it, that's been a success story for them. Uh, and uh, it, it's great that we still have some of our ex-Kudos colleagues in AstraZeneca as well as other companies in this arena. Now, these are the results of a clinical trial actually led by Jonathan Lederman in London, which really um, uh, were, were pivotal in actually getting approval. These are varying cancer uh, data, basically showing that patients receiving Alaprib did much, much better. These are BRCA uh, patients, uh, did much better than the placebo in terms of progression-free survival. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, Alaprib... Um, now, with its trade name, Limpasa became the, became the world's first PARP inhibitor to be um, registered um, for uh, use um, uh, in, 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 in cancer. Uh, and so there are a number of firsts um, for Alaprib. It's the first DNA repair inhibitor drug approved in the world. It's the world's first synthetic lethality medicine, if you like. It's the first cancer drug targeting inherited predisposition to cancer, although we now know that somatically acquired BRCA mutations also make cancers susceptible to these uh, kind of agents. It was notable that it was launched with a genetic diagnostic for the BRCA status of cells. So if you like, it's one of these precision medicines that we've heard a lot about. Uh, and we now know that these uh, Alaprib, but also other PARP inhibitors, uh, are also got opportunities and are actually approved for other cancers, including um, uh, those that are more sporadic rather than inherited in terms of their predisposition. And so, um, as of now, uh, Alaprib has gone to over 35,000 patients, and this year is going to make a billion dollar sales for AstraZeneca, so it's become a blockbuster. Unfortunately, the University of Cambridge, me, don't get any uh, royalties on this. Um, uh, for, for me, and I guess everybody associated with the journey of making this drug, the biggest thing is the impact. And it was very nice a few years ago that Worldwide Cancer Research, one of the first charities to fund me, along with Cancer Research UK, um, actually arranged me to, to meet this lady here in the Botanic Gardens in Cambridge. Uh, and being a non-clinician, I don't, I haven't, she was actually the first patient I'd ever met who'd really had a dramatic response, positive response to Alaprib. And it turns out that uh, Sandy, uh, other treatments had failed her a number of years ago, and she registered into a Alaprib clinical trial. And to this day, her tumours totally disappeared. And it was great meeting up with her and hearing about all the things that she'd been able to do that she wouldn't have done if it wasn't for this drug. So what we're learning now as well is that although Alaprib and I guess most other cancer medicines tend to make it or not based on 
being tricked, taken into patients that are resistant to existing therapies, so basically end-stage patients often, what we're now learning is that the earlier we're using uh, PARP inhibitors, such as Alaprib, the greater the effect is. And that's probably for a whole host of reasons, but it's very exciting to see that uh, the earlier that the, 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 uh, uh, PARP inhibitors are being used in patients, the, the greater the differential uh, between the placebo group actually turns out to be. So this is all very, very positive, but it's actually mixed news. These patients here, which are doing, on average, much better than the placebos, many of these patients, nevertheless, are either not responding at the outset or revolving resistance to PARP inhibitors. So I think it's going to be very, very important for us to understand those resistance mechanisms, and I'll come on to that in a few moments. We now know that DNA repair, DNA damage response mechanisms um, uh, offer a lot of potential. There are other enzymes in these pathways that are also being exploited by a range of other companies, including some of those in the Cambridge arena. So just back to this issue of resistance. There are patients that respond, evolve resistance, and it's clear that we need to understand these resistance mechanisms. Who knows, maybe we might be able to prevent them occurring or even exploit them. So how could we try and understand these resistance mechanisms? So the approach that my lab's been uh, uh, applying uh, to try and understand resistance mechanisms is using synthetic viability principles. So in this case, for example, we can imagine if we had a cancer cell that, with a mutation in BRCA1 treated with a DNA damaging agent, sorry, a DNA damaging agent or a uh, PARP inhibitor, for example, that should kill the cancer cell. What we could do, could we do genetic screens to identify genes such as gene B, which when changed, would actually allow these cancer cells or other cells to survive. And we're doing this in two ways in my lab. We're doing this um, um, through haploid chemical genetic screens, um, but we've actually uh, made most progress in the last few years using CRISPR-Cas9 focused and genome-wide screens. And I'm going to share with you two recently published uh, examples of this and then take, take you, uh, round off my talk today with where I think it's actually taking us in terms of potential clinical applications. So a typical CRISPR-Cas9 screen that we carry out in, in my lab, and obviously many of you will be aware of this, but just for those of you who aren't, is that we can... Um, Cas9 is a nuclease enzyme that you can target to loci within cells through an associated guide RNA. The guide RNA recognizes the sequence of that gene, and you can either use this in an individual guide RNA to target Cas9 to a, to a single gene and cause a mutation at that gene, or you can transduce a population of cells with a whole range of guide RNAs against essentially all of the genes. And therefore, in that population, you can edit in different cells different genes and end up with a population of cells knocked out for each, for example, of the 20,000 or so human genes. So in our screens, um, let's say genome-wide screens that we're doing, we'll transduce a large population of cells. Those cells are edited, and then we can treat them with drug or other conditions and put them through a pathway like this and at the end, we harvest the cells, do PCR around the guide RNA sequences, which are integrated in the genome because these are delivered through a lentivirus, and then through next-generation sequencing, we can look at the constellation of, of the barcodes for the CRISPRs at the beginning of the experiment compared to the end, and also compare, for example, treatment versus not mock treatment. And through bioinformatics, we can identify genes that are predicted to, for example, give resistance or sensitivity to drugs such as PARP inhibitors. Okay. So one example of this uh, we published a year, and, a year and a half ago is where basically we took BRCA1 mutant cells, treated them with PARP inhibitors or not, and after we'd uh, transduced them with a genome-wide uh, CRISPR library. Um, and this turned out to be a, a very uh, powerful screen. So we actually used three different PARP inhibitors in three sets of experiments and we identified a set of genes which, when knocked out, give resistance in this kind of setting. Um, we identified some known factors, but we were very uh, excited to see that we, this, these, these, these screens also identified two, at that time, uncharacterized new proteins. And to cut a long story short, this actually told us two things. One, it told us how cells can evolve resistance to PARP inhibitors in the absence of BRCA1, and it actually told us what BRCA1 does. So to depict this here, what I'm showing you is that this, this screen identified a range of proteins, including these proteins here, that we and others have collectively called shielding. So what we think shielding is doing is it promotes non-homologous end joining. 
And the way it promotes non-homologous end joining is it's loaded on sites of double-strand breaks, and it actually prevents a process called double-strand break resection. What is resection? Well, resection is a process where you get a double-strand break and then eat away one of the DNA strands to give you three-prime single-stranded DNA. This resection step is actually crucial to channel double-strand breaks into homologous recombination because this single-stranded DNA is what catalyzes the first step of homologous recombination. So controlling resection is a way of controlling which DNA repair pathway you use. If you do resect, you go into homologous recombination and you suppress non-homologous end joining. If you don't resect, you'll do non-homologous end joining. You can't do homologous recombination. So in a normal cell, the, um, have it, the shielding is there that allows the cell to do non-homologous end joining. But these cells, when it's necessary, such as in, in, in response to PARP inhibitors during S phase, they can carry out homologous recombination because BRCA1 overcomes shielding and allows resection to take place. So if cells lose shielding, they become defective in non-homologous end joining, and that makes them radiosensitive. If a cell lacks BRCA1, the defect in homologous recombination occurs because there's no way of effectively counteracting shielding. So this means homologous recombination is impaired. And this explains why, if you knock out shielding, you're actually able to rescue the PARP inhibitor hypersensitivity of BRCA1 deficient cells, because without shielding, you no longer need BRCA1 to carry out homologous recombination. So I think it's interesting to think that over evolution, this homologous recombination apparatus is being uh, controlled. Uh, and the mechanism that's evolved is to evolve an inhibitor of homologous recombination shielding, and then to come, to come up with an anti-inhibitor, a, 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 a BRCA1, which overcomes that inhibition in a controlled way. So these data have actually told us that one of the key functions of BRCA1 is actually to counteract the shielding complex. Um, with our colleagues here in Cambridge, we're looking at the potential clinical uh, um, uh, relevance of these findings. And what we are finding through PDX, patient-derived xenograft and uh, models, is that shielding components are uh, being downregulated or mutated, but it actually seems to be more at the epigenetic transcriptional downregulation level uh, in various uh, PDX models that have evolved resistance to PARP inhibitors. Okay. So another example of a CRISPR screen that we've carried out, which is given as mechanistic insight, is in the absence of the ATM protein. As you remember, ATM is a protein kinase, which has also been connected to homologous recombination. Actually, <coughs> previous data indicate that ATM potentiates resection. Okay. So <coughs> in this case, these three individuals in my lab carried out screens to look at ways of potentially suppressing ATM deficiency. ATM deficiency is associated with cancer, but it's also associated with a genetic condition called ataxia telangiectasia, which is a neurodegenerative and cancer predisposition syndrome. So for these screens, we, uh, in this case, we use mouse cells that contain ATM or lack ATM, <coughs> and therefore uh, uh, are impaired in certain DNA damage responses. And if we just look down here, this is a very nice way of looking at the, one of the phenotypes for ATM deficient cells. These are cells grown, grown, up, grown on plates and then stained blue. And you can see that if you increasingly increase concentrations of this drug here, topotecan, which is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, that basically you can uh, find conditions that will selectively kill the ATM deficient cells but have very little effect on the ATM++ cells. So topoisomerase 1 inhibitors actually work rather like PARP inhibitors. Top 1 inhibitors uh, in S phase generate double-strand breaks through basically top 1 inhibitors inhibit topoisomerase 1, uh, therefore um, cause persistent single-strand breaks that are, are processed into double-strand breaks during S phase. And again, these are double-strand breaks that need to be repaired by homologous recombination. So the basis of the screen that I'm just going to quickly take you through now is to, for example, identify this condition here that will kill ATM minor cells, but not ATM plus cells, and see if we can identify any other genes which, when knocked out, will suppress that phenotype. And <clears throat> this also turned out to be a rather nice uh, screen in terms of its outputs. This is a genome-wide screen. And basically, we end up with just about all components of two DNA repair complexes. 
One of those DNA repair complexes is DNA ligase 4 and XRCC4, which is part of the non-homologous end joining apparatus. <coughs> and actually, these factors we connected to homologous combination in 1997, um, together with Michael Lieber's lab. <coughs> we also identified just about all the other components of another complex called the BRCA1A complex. So just to show you how powerful this resistance is, we then go back and make gene-edited clonal populations of cells. <clears throat> so this, again, is showing that wild-type cells can withstand quite high concentrations of topotecan. <clears throat> An ATM knockout cell <clears throat> excuse me, is, is, is very sensitive. If we then go ahead in that ATM, ligase, sorry, ATM knockout background, knockout DNA ligase 4 or XRCC4, these are two independent clones, we can see we get very strong resistance. And if we are to plot these on a curve, we can actually see this resistance is quite profound. These are the wild-type cells here in black. These are the ATM minus cells in red. And these are the double mutant cells. So these cells are knocked out for ATM plus ligase 4 or XRCC4. So this is sort of weird in a way. You've got a DNA repair deficiency that gives you DNA damage sensitivity, and you're able to counteract that by losing another DNA repair pathway. How could this be? <clears throat> so we did the screen with topotecan, but basically these suppressors also operate with other agents, such as alaprid. Okay. So how could this be? Well, a key finding, actually made by Joseph Foreman uh, in the lab, who's now um, uh, doing extremely well as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a team leader in AstraZeneca, was showing that not just DNA ligase 4, but DNA ligase catalytic activity is needed for this phenotype. So what he did was to go ahead and gene edit the catalytic site of DNA ligase 4. So the protein's still there, but it's not able to mediate DNA ligation. And we find that these cells with a point mutation in the ligase 4 catalytic site are also resistant in the context of ATM deficiency. So these, together with other data, actually took us to what we think is the mechanism. Now, remember that PARP inhibitors, topoisomerase 1 inhibitors, um, are stabilizing these kinds of structures, which during S phase are repaired, need to be repaired by homologous recombination. What we think is going on in the absence of ATM, when you treat them with topoisomerase 1 inhibitors or PARP inhibitors, is that they die not because they have an impairment in homologous recombination per se, but because they end up ligating these DNA ends through non homologous end joining. So that's using the wrong DNA repair pathway at the wrong time. And that cells die through these chromosomal fusions will then kill cells through mitotic catastrophes. And we actually can see this when we look at chromosome spread. So ATM-deficient cells treated um, with, with topotecan or uh, 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 PARP inhibitors have a large number of translocations. Almost every mitotic uh, figure will have more than one. And we can largely suppress these if we knock out DNA ligase 4. So, so what we think is going on, I'll just take you through the scenario of why these cells are dying and why ligase 4, XRCC4 loss is able to suppress. So in a normal situation, if you have these one-ended double-strand breaks arising in S phase, a normal cell can repair them by homologous recombination. And that's because it has all the machinery to do this. And furthermore, this ATM protein is there. And what we know ATM is now doing is it's suppressing non-homologous end joining. There are various mechanisms we think that's being mediated, but it's also accelerating resection. So ATM targets a protein called CTIP, which accelerates resection and shuffles, therefore um, promotes these double strand breaks to be repaired by the right pathway. In the absence of ATM, you no longer effectively suppress non-homologous end joining and resection is delayed. Now, many of these double strand breaks can still be repaired by homologous combination, but what actually kills the cell is through non homologous end joining, ligating some of those and causing chromosomal translocations. And of course, what happens in, if, you, if you lack ATM but also lack non homologous end joining is that even though resection is delayed, there's no bad DNA repair pathway in this context, and so these double strand breaks are repaired more slowly, but nevertheless, they do get repaired. And to try and explain this to, 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 to well, um, investors and whatever, I, I, I use the idea that ATM is, 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 a, is, a, is a traffic attendant, basically, um, getting, um, stopping the traffic, uh, which is normal send joining, and getting the kids across the road to school or whatever. If you don't have that there, then, okay, 
there's, there's a big problem when, when those individuals try to get across the road because there's the nasty traffic. But of course, if the traffic's not there, even if these individuals take their time getting across the road, they're going go to be able to get over there safely in the end. For the aficionados, um, the other complex that we identified, the BRCA1A complex, is that if you lose the BRCA1A complex, you actually get um, faster resection because the BRCA1A complex is an anti-resection component. And so in this case, resection is occurring more quickly. So even though you have uh, non mars end joining, it's not able to uh, act on very many of these double-strand breaks. And that's why we think resection is, is, is overcoming the, 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 the uh, sensitivity in that context. So to round off today, <coughs> obviously that's um, all quite... Uh, mechanistic in terms of understanding DNA repair pathways and how they can antagonize and compete with each other. But I think it's also maybe suggesting opportunities in the clinic. Now, I already mentioned that we're looking in PDX models in the context of BRCA deficiency for looking at the shielding uh, component loss. But we're also now looking in the context of ATM deficient uh, cancers and seeing whether or not loss of proteins such as ligase 4 XRCC4 are allowing these cells to have developed resistance to PARP inhibitors and other agents. But of course, in the end, if we are to explain a resistance mechanism, that doesn't really help the patient. Um, this unfortunate patient here, for example, is their, that, that person's cancer has evolved resistance. It's not going to help the patient very much just to say, well, we know why that resistance is taking place. Well, maybe it does, because very excitingly, what we're finding is the resistance mechanism for one drug in many cases, is actually giving another vulnerability and actually giving sensitivity to another agent. So here, for example, we're finding that loss of XRCC4 or ligase 4 in the, in the context of ATM deficiency is causing the cells to become more resistant to uh, topotecan or other top 1 or PARP inhibitors. But these double mutant cells are actually more sensitive to ionizing radiation and radiomimetic agents. In a similar way, I've shown to you uh, a few moments, uh, a short while ago, that loss of the shielding components gives resistance to PARP inhibitors in the context of ATM, uh, in the context of BRCA1 deficiency. But what we're seeing is that these double mutant cells that are resistant to PARP inhibitors are actually now very, very sensitive to DNA cross-linking agents. So thinking about this in a more optimistic way, I think if we can understand these resistance mechanisms, we might be able to come together uh, with, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, combination treatments to, to, to prevent them arising, or even exploit them through using sequential different DNA repair pathways, perhaps one day in a predictable way um, uh, as, as, as a resistance evolves to one drug. So if you like, I, in, on an optimistic uh, note, I think if we understand these pathways, we can understand opportunities for targeting cancer through using synthetic lethality type mechanisms, but we can also use synthetic viability uh, approaches, for example, to try and understand the resistance mechanisms that we can then try and exploit either through other agents that we've got or through synthetic lethality screens again to identify additional vulnerabilities that those resistance mechanisms might confer. So... <clears throat> Um, this is uh, my academic lab in, in, in the Gurdon Institute just up the road. Um, and we're still carrying on with these mechanistic studies into DNA repair. But just to round off, I just want to highlight that I think there are other opportunities. You heard from Paul Thompson two days ago from Mission Therapeutics how developing drugs against deubicolating enzymes may give, give us opportunities um, not just in cancer but in other areas, including perhaps mitochondrial disease. Um, and for younger people in the audience... DNA repair, all of these intracellular pathways have been researched for many, many years. But of course, now we're in a situation that we have a whole range of technologies, CRISPR-Cas9, <coughs> screening methodologies, genetics, next generation sequencing that we just didn't have just a few years ago. So I think now it's more exciting times than ever to be really thinking about fundamental cellular mechanisms, using these approaches and others to understand those mechanisms and think about therapeutic opportunities. Um, and I think more broadly, outside the context of cancer, I think basically health and disease is about balance and imbalance. And if we can understand what's normal and the imbalances that are associated with diseases, that's going to give us key insights into disease mechanisms. <clears throat> and it should also identify potential opportunities to rebalance disease or prevent the imbalance occurring in the first instance. And so that is the basis <clears throat> of a company that I recently established called Adrestia.
Um, uh, Adrestia is a lesser known Greek goddess of war and divine retribution between good and evil. Um, so she rights wrongs. And basically, the idea behind Adrestia is to understand fundamental cellular imbalances connected to genetic diseases, and then through synthetic viability and other approaches, identify therapeutic targets that, when inhibited, can rebalance disease phenotypes towards normality using synthetic viability types of principles. And just to highlight that, we've recently <coughs> carried out a few proof of concept screens. In this case, for example, we took a UV sensitivity syndrome called um, <coughs> Ezeroderma pigmentosum. These cells are very sensitive to DNA damage, um, particularly ultraviolet light. And we carried a, a genome, out a genome-wide screen for suppressors we end up with just two hits, basically. Um, <clears throat> one of them is actually the gene which is mutated in those cells. <clears throat> it turns out that these CRISPRs are basically putting the things back in frame. It was a frame shift, and it's putting it back in frame. And the other is a DNA helicase, um, which basically is a potential druggable target that might be a potential druggable target for this and who knows other diseases. So I'll leave it there. Uh, that's the idea behind Adrestia. I think there's big opportunities there. I'm trying to convince investors uh, about that at the moment. It's never easy to convince uh, investors to part with their money, but hopefully we'll get there sometime in the not too distant future. Um, my academic lab, of course, is still very, very fundamentally focused on the mechanisms, and we're um, um, uh, just very grateful for support from the Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, and the European Union. Uh, and I'll take questions. Thanks. It was very nice presentation, thank you. thank you. So my question is uh, relating the neurodegeneration in, for example, ATM deficiency. Do you think that with similar uh, targeting uh, other uh, genes, would it be also a treatment for the neurodegeneration? That's a great question. Of course, <clears throat> the problem with the neurodegeneration, we don't quite know what the mechanism is, which is triggering that. I think there is, there, it is possible that the oxidative damage occurring in Purkinje cells in ATM patients might be um, having effects on topoisomerase enzymes. So if that's the case, it is possible that these cells are dying through mechanisms that might be suppressible through a DNA ligase 4, XRCC4, but we don't yet know. And unfortunately, there's no decent mouse model for the neurodegeneration <coughs> in AT. Um, we are actually making... Um, uh, a, a, a double mutant mouse now through one of the hits that we identified um, an ATM deficiency and we're going to first of all see if we can suppress cancer predisposition in the mouse model um, but uh, no you, 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 you point out a very important challenge uh, of course it's, it's difficult to do any of these kind of screens in post mitotic or non-dividing cells and that's why we're limited in that regard yeah. very nice talk um, you have these mechanisms of resistance. Is there any thoughts to uh, upfront treating with the two drugs that would block that mechanism of resistance to prevent it from occurring in the first place? Um, I think that will be a, a very interesting idea uh, to, to, to do combination therapies. When you start combining, for example, PARP inhibitors with other DNA damaging agents, you do actually get <coughs> toxicities, drug drug toxicities, so it has to be um, carried out very, very carefully. Of course, by the time a, a, a cancer has evolved to, to a late-stage cancer, you've got a lot of heterogeneity there, and it could be that there's multiple resistance mechanisms going on. So I think this optimistic scenario I'm talking about um, is going to be more realistic, I think, if we can identify cancers as early as possible. Um, and perhaps things like PARP inhibitors might actually, in the end, uh, be used in certain cases in a prophylactic way, uh, because BRCA1 loss in a, in a certain cell doesn't make that cell a cancer cell. It just sets it on the trajectory to become a cancer cell. And so who knows, maybe in the future, the uh, uh, ladies with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, instead of electing for radical surgery that they often do now, maybe you could take a PARP inhibitor once every couple of years to maybe mop up these cells before they've actually evolved into cancer. So I, your idea of, of, of combination therapies is, is a great one. The other approach, of course, is, is actually... And there's a lot of growing data uh, 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 and excitement about this, is, is basically toggling d between different therapies in smart ways. Yeah. So I was wondering whether or not um, you could just elucidate um, sort of overlap with mitochondrial DNA re repair and things. I mean, do any of these key proteins target to mitochondria? I mean, I think, is, is, doesn't, doesn't BRCA1 get into to mitochondria? If so, what does it do? Um, Mitochondria isn't really my, my arena, but I do know that there's been a, a large number of researchers over many years now, 
thinking about and actually researching DNA repair mechanisms in mitochondria. Of course, mitochondria do have re repair mechanisms. Um, I think it's difficult to, to be absolutely sure which factors are there in mitochondria and, or not. As far as I'm aware, there's, there's no decent uh, strong data for the BRCA1 homologous recombination apparatus in mitochondria, but they certainly have ability to, to mediate uh, uh, nucleotide excision repair, basic excision repair, single strand break repair. So this is an exciting arena. One of my colleagues in the Gurdon uh, Institute, Hansong Ma, is actually putting quite a lot of effort at the present time to try and understand these mechanisms. Hi. Um, so that was terrific. I have, I have two questions for you. One is science and one is philosophy. <laughs> so okay. for the science first, I usually think of chemotherapies as having a lot of toxic effects and you want to minimize them, <coughs> but I'm really intrigued with your PARP1 inhibitor, so, and then it's been in so many people. We had done a study with hyperglycemic uh, worms, so PARP1 binds to w one of the major loci, uh, TCF7L2, that causes type 2 diabetes. Right. And so okay. if you give Olaparib, um, in cells, and we've done it in worms, it seems to block diabetes. So I'm curious, do you actually have a chemotherapy that has beneficial side effects? Is there less diabetes in your treated patients? I don't know. I think it would be very interesting to look at in, in the, the, these patient cohorts uh, for other phenotypes that aren't associated with their cancer. Of course, there are patients now um, who've been on PARP inhibitors daily for seven, eight, nine years now. So I think uh, that will be an interesting arena. Uh, I don't know what the mechanism for that could actually be. Um, yeah, it's blocking we, the major signaling pathway that's right, involved. Okay. So, but it would be interesting because it would, when you found your BRCA1 mutation, it would be even more convincing that you might want to start daily therapy, right? There you go. I didn't know about that. That's an exciting <laughs> potential arena for the future. Yeah. I mean, we tend to think of chemotherapies, any drug, as having negative side effects. But, but who knows? In some cases, they might actually be positive in terms of other uh, indications. Yeah, so great. And then I guess my other question is the philosophy. So you went from academia and you stayed in academia, but you also went to pharma. And there's lots of people here that are either starting to think about that or the conflicts of doing that or the benefits of doing that. I would just be interested in your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I mean, setting up QDOS, um, I wouldn't say it almost killed me, but it felt like it was almost killing me. It wasn't, wasn't easy and, and, and setting up a company is ne nev never easy. In the end, me and my colleagues, many colleagues obviously with QDOS, but also the, the huge number of individuals that you need to take a program all the way through is a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, but when it works, it means it's all really, really worthwhile. Um, I don't think many academics, uh, certainly myself, do this because they want to get rich, and I don't think I've got particularly rich. I've done okay out of it. Uh, but making a difference, I think that's what it's all about, and it is exciting. And I think particularly if, you, if, you, <clears throat> if you're a, a lab head or a younger researcher, it's just a really exciting area if you can actually do good science, um, but also translational science at the same time. It used to be the case that, that basically uh, if, if you're an academic and you move it into industry, you were basically selling your soul and you were basically giving away your high-quality science, whereas now I think you really can do both at the same time. Having said that, I try to keep my academic lab um, as pure as possible. N no commercial funding is going into my lab quite right now. We're doing standard cell and molecular biology, fundamental science in my academic lab. If we have translational opportunities, we try and do that on the outside through using the tech transfer uh, arrangement at the University of Cambridge. Um, so philosophically, um, I think it's, it's, it's a very exciting arena. I didn't really think I was going to set up another company, uh, but the mission sort of happened, and Adrestia is sort of, I hope, happening right now. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I've answered your philosophical question. I, I think if it feels like the right thing to do, then give it a go. That's my view. Steve, can I ask uh, uh, two one technical and one science question, if that's yeah. okay? So there's lots of ways of doing genetic screens, and so when you're doing CRISPR-Cas9, of course, that's going to be introducing yep. double-strand breaks. And I'm wondering, given that you're actually studying processes that are related to double-strand break and DNA repair, does this, is this a particularly good screen, screening strategy that actually helps you find more results, or does it potentially confound the discovery of suppressors and synthetic lethals? Um. We know all the cells that were, I mean, of course, if we were doing it in a background where you, where you were not doing efficient Cas9 um, uh, non-homologous cell joining mutational repair, that, that will be an issue. But we've, we've, you know, of course, I've talked about DNA repair screens, but we have done a couple of other screens, genetic screens, Cas9 screens, 
uh, in non-DNA repair backgrounds for suppressors of other phenotypes, and that's looking very encouraging too. Um, of course, there are other flavors of CRISPR-Cas9. You, you can use CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A, uh, where you're not generating breaks, but regulating transcription. And we've carried out our first CRISPR-I screens, and they seem to be working quite well as well. Of course, shRNA, siRNA screens are also uh, 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 very interesting things to use. I mentioned doing haploid genetic screens using chemical genetic screens. They are feasible now. They're just, they're just very expensive and laborious because you have to do next generation sequencing of the whole genome to identify the driver mutations. But what we are finding, and we've actually done this in yeast. This is stuff that's been pioneered by Fabio Padoux, who's here at the conference from my lab, um, is, 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 is you can actually find through those approaches mutations that, for example, are gain of function or separation of function mutations that drive a phenotype. It, and in, some, in many cases, those phenotypes you wouldn't get through a whole gene knockout. So there are limitations, certainly, of CRISPR-Cas9 screens that I've been talking about. And I, and I had one science question, and that is, through your approaches, you're identifying in cell culture uh, suppressors and yeah. synthetic lethals. To what extent are the resistance mechanisms that are being observed in human patients receiving these drugs to what extent are the resistance mechanisms you find in cell culture actually predictive or corresponding to those observed in the tumors? Yeah, I think what we ask, if you do a genetic screen, you'll get genetic, um, <laughs> you'll get genetic drivers. And I think it is interest, it's important to bear in mind the fact that even though the same mechanism might be occurring in the cancer, it might be through epigenetic routes. So for example, we identified shielding in the BRCA1 through a genetic screen but it looks like in the PDX models, it's not so much mutations, but epigenetic downregulation of those targets. Um, um, and, and, and in many cases, not black and white, but just somewhat reduced, that's actually given resistance. Um, so, so, so I think that is, is something that needs to be borne in mind as well. Steve, so I've got two questions. Yeah. Uh, first one. Um, uh, is to ask your th views about this. So the issue of treating cancer resistance is reminiscent of antibiotic resistance yeah. and infection. C could you imagine a scenario when actually the opposite's happening, where you're carefully choosing which treatments to give at which stage in order to avoid the emergence of resistant clones? Because yeah. in the end, all we're trying to do is promote lifespan. Yeah. Uh, and if you did it in a bit more careful way, rather than throwing everything at, at the cancer when you first saw it, you might actually lead to a, a longer lifespan. Yeah, and that relates to the question that, that came up over here. If, I think in the end, I'm, you know, if you're talking about, about fundamental mechanisms like DNA repair, the cell can reroute things, but there are only a certain way, number of routes you can take. So if you can understand all those possibilities and you have drugs, ideally non-toxic drugs, that can head those different routes off, I think we, we could be in a situation where you use smart combinations. Um, but there are always these other issues of, of, and it gets very, very complicated when you're, when you're combining agents together. I think it's going to be more difficult than antibiotics um, because antibiotics, you're targeting cells that are very different than the normal cells of the patient. And the issue here is that if you're targeting DNA repair mechanisms, you are going to have an impact on the normal cells as well. And that's something we've always got to be very careful about. I mean, PARP inhibitors, uh, I talk about them as one day maybe being used prophylactically in BRCA1. Mutant carriers... Um, but inhibiting DNA repair mechanisms long-term in a normal person or in the normal cells of a person is probably not going to be a good thing and that you might be generating the potential for um, uh, therapy-induced cancers further down the line. Obviously, if it's a late-stage cancer patient, that's, that's a, a cost-benefit equation, which means you'll take the drug, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in other contexts, it wouldn't be. Thanks. And just the final point, which maybe we could finish off with, is it's interesting to hear that Mrs. Jackson came up with the title Kudos. Yeah. I wonder whether she was involved in the decision about the Greek goddess balancing good and evil. No, um, no. So actually, Mission, mission was uh, actually because I learned from my colleagues in Berkeley that that was my nickname, Man on a Mission. I didn't know actually until many, many years later. Um, and addressed you. Now I was just uh, lying in bed one night trying to think, uh, as I often do with my iPhone, on the, on the web trying to think of, of, of ways depicting rebalancing, disease rebalancing. And uh, I, anyway, addressed you popped up <laughs> as a Google search. <laughs> we, so we, we, blame Google. Pop. We should probably, uh, and okay. I think that's a great point to end. Great. So thanks, thanks so much, Steve, for a great uh, keynote.